Welcome to the podcast. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, excited to chat with you because you have done something and are doing something that uh, not only do I have not any expertise in, I'm really curious in it. I'm also very intimidated by what you do, which is events where either virtually uh, in the last year and a half, especially, or in person, you gather a bunch of people. And to me, that seems like really stressful and hard. <laughs> is it stressful? Yes. Is it hard? And then give us a little background about what it is that you do and what you're up to. Yes. Is it stressful? Is it hard? I would say yes. And it depends on your personality sure. type. Cause I think there are two people in this world that are like, yes, I want to plan an event and bring people together. And this yeah. brings me so much joy. And then there's the other types. It's like you, you're like, no, no, yeah. no, no hard pass. Yeah. <laughs> but I there's just, a lot I, of logistics. Yes. Which is the hard part. It's, it seems like you have to be somebody who's not only a people person, you love to be with people, hang out with people, gather people, uh, but you also have to be somebody who's really good at logistics or have somebody on your team that you work with who's really good at logistics and planning. Um, did you know getting into it that those would be things that you're good at or is there somebody on your team who's good at it? What does that look like for you in terms of making a decision around building a business around events and bringing people together? Yeah, so I'm actually very lucky and privileged in the sense that I have a sister-in-law who was a an event planner Perfect. for Fortune 500 companies for yep. two decades. And I said, right. hey, Stephanie, how would you feel about teaching me how to throw a conference? And she was like, yeah. yes, because I've always been a people person. Uh -huh. I love that element. That is where I shine and light up is bringing people together. I'm very much an extrovert that way. Yep. And so I, I didn't have that specific skill set, but I'm very strategic and do like logistics and, and digging through things and processes. But through her guidance, we did that. And of course, we have an amazing team. Leslie is our operations and logistics manager on the Tastemaker team. So cool. she helps keep all that going. Yeah. Yeah. What were, when you sat down with your sister-in-law, what were the things that were eye-opening or interesting to you in terms of what it takes to pull off a event, like running an event, event-based business? Yeah. So the, the planning, the, the lead time that you need, I mean, I sure. know a lot of bloggers, it differs depending on your work style, but lead time is generally anywhere from what three to six months. But with uh -huh. an event, you have to have a lead time of anywhere from one to two years. Sure. So, you know, we, we've been planning for 20, well, the pandemic notwithstanding yep. has kind of messed things up, but you know, we'll be planning our events that are two years down the road. And so I think for me, cause I'm very much like a fly by the seat of your pants, spontaneous type of person as sure. well. So it was hard for me to commit to something so far yep. in the future but it, it definitely helps things not be as stressful when you have that yeah. game plan and you know exactly every step. I was surprised too to see the event resume that one puts together. It's every detail down by the minute uh -huh. at certain uh -huh. points. So it's very, very detail oriented. Yeah. It's, I have a friend who's a wedding videographer and he talks about what that reality is like to be like booking his next summer a year before, but you really, mm -hmm. I would assume you have to get into the rhythm of always thinking a year in advance. Mm -hmm. So even while also thinking about, you know, six months from now or three months from now, like there's always those deadlines, things that you need to take care of along the way. Yep. Um, when did you do your first event? And when did you decide, Hey, this is actually something that I want to do. I want to build around this uh, and yeah. build a business around it. Yeah. The, the genesis of tastemaker. So our first event was actually in 2018, which it's insane to think that it's mm -hmm. almost four years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, cause 2021 is almost over. And, um, it started actually, I got this idea in 2017 because I have been blogging since 2010 mm -hmm. and it started as a lifestyle blog. And then I niched into, uh, food blogging and food photography in 2015 and realized in 2017, you know what, I would love to have a conference that is a little more intimate, that hosts around 200, 250 people, that is this very experiential bespoke event that doesn't exist for food bloggers. And mm -hmm. I did have Stephanie, my sister-in-law that I mentioned as a resource. I'm like, you know, this is the perfect opportunity. And it was one of those just magical things. I remember mm -hmm. reading Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert of, of this idea, the idea of how things are waiting to be made manifest. And this was my thing. And it kept coming back and it kept coming back and I just couldn't ignore it any longer. And then decided to go for it. And it, it was the biggest leap of faith I've ever taken in terms of the business because 
A, I didn't know how to do it. And B, it was just it, kind of a radical idea to think that I could you know, do something and pull it off. But obviously there was a huge need for it. We were able to sell out the first year. We've been able to sell out every year since. We've been able to stay you know, alive during a pandemic by transitioning yeah. virtually. And it's just something that's really needed because as you know, it can be very alienating to be working by yourself all day from your computer. As a lot of people now know working from home and we just, we crave that, that in-person connection so much and it provides that opportunity. Yeah. And I, I recently got back from it's my, the first like trip I've done in like mm-hmm. two years and it was a meetup. There's maybe 10 other people who run similar, but not exactly the same types of businesses. So like somebody who focuses on book launches and somebody else who has a technology website and got together to hang out. And it was just kind of a chance to be together in person. And what's interesting is people can say the same things that you maybe would read in like a blog post or you'd hear in a podcast, but there's something Mm -hmm. about being together with people. I think this applies virtually as well, but especially in person where what people say and the information you get, you receive it in a different way where it seems more transformative. Mm -hmm. And I hear that a lot where people have gone to a conference and that's kind of been the catalyst for something for them, like inspiration or an idea or a concept. It's like, when you're in a space with people doing similar things, you're inspired in a way that you can't be, even if it's the same information that you're getting from somewhere else. Um, what Talk a little bit about your site, uh, what that is, and then have you shifted your focus now that you have traction in this new area? And how do you balance a pre-existing idea that you were focusing on and building with something else that's new and exciting and that has a lot of traction? Yeah. So you're talking about specifically the butter half, my food blogger website and transition to that. Yeah. So the, the butter half is, is something that I started as a, you know, kind of a passion project, but realizing, oh, I can make a lot of money by niching down in this Mm -hmm. this blogging world. And, um, you know, that was its own journey in itself of, I started it as making family recipes and then through a series of health issues, decided to really niche down into more gluten-free health Mm -hmm. nutrition focus. And I actually, my last, my focus for the last year and a half, two years has been creating a cookbook called Root and Nourish that was published earlier this year in April of 2021. And so that really was my focus. I had these two buckets because I'm very big on boundaries and bandwidth and not doing all the things, which I know you talk about. Um, And And, you know, so I was focusing on that and then focusing on Tastemaker because that was, those were the two income streams that just made the most sense for me for personal goals, professional goals and everything. And, you know, since then, since the pandemic happened though, I really had to sit down and make a choice of, do I want to keep putting a bunch of time and energy into the butter half right now or focus on Tastemaker? And I kind of hit that crossroad where I'm like, you know what? I'm going to choose the Tastemaker route because this just feels like the next, next logical step because I... I've learned at least in my own experience that you can't fully shine and commit and grow something unless you, you give that 100% of your energy, right. Where focus goes, energy flows type of vibe. Yep. Totally. You know, and I, you know, I could essentially hire a team to run out the butter half if I wanted to, but this is something I just wanted to step into fully. So for now, the butter half has passive income that I still rely on, which I was able to set it up over the course of those years to, to do that. So it still exists. And it's just not the season right now to be focusing on that, but it's set up so that I can return to it whenever I'm ready to. And it still is very much like a part of my history and brand. And I keep up to date on what food bloggers are doing and the education they need, but it's from the lens of, okay, how can we create a conference and create this, this educational platform where we bring experts together to, to teach people and connect them. That's awesome. It's one of the things that I love about the pursuit of an area of interest or passion, uh, in your case, your blog, your website is a lot of times that will evolve into a new thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means it's a new thing within the thing you're doing. Like you get into it and you realize, wow, I really love photography. And so instead of pursuing a business, you know, with display ads from a bunch of traffic to recipes, somebody says, I'm actually going to pursue photography is what I do or videography or web development. In your case, it feels like the evolution is Hey, I really like this thing. And there's a community around this thing that Mm -hmm. needs education and resources. 
that feels like a really good fit for me. So I'm going to evolve into the next thing. And some people will sit in the same place forever and it's a good fit where they started, but other people, they evolve, evolve into a new thing. And I'm curious to know what that looked like from a uh, business decision perspective. So a lot of times you'll hear people talk about like conferences are really hard and it's really hard to make money within conferences. Mm -hmm. um, and my, my guess is it's not like a blog in that with a blog, you can start and you're like, okay, I can maybe pull this off for like a hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. But with a conference, you're like signing contracts and you have people who are uh, going to pay you a certain amount and do pay you that amount. And you don't know there's a, the stakes are a little bit higher. Uh, yes. <laughs> what did that look like for you to get started with that? And what did you learn about running a conference business? Cause it kind of fits in this space of events. We talked to Liz from the lemon bowl, how mm -hmm. she does events and, um, and how she fits that into her business. But what, what did you learn about the business of events? Uh, as you've gotten gotten into it over the past uh, few years? Yeah, so when you mentioned the stakes are high, that's 100%, that's where that that faith was involved of like, I have to have a really solid business strategy for that. And mm -hmm. so I am very much a fan of, you gotta spend money to make money. I think that sure. is an old cliche yep. adage that we all live by. And it's it's this, notion of, are we putting it into practice or just saying that? Yeah. And so I took, honestly, I took a big risk, which when you start a business outside of blogging, because it is such low stakes and the overhead is so low, you can start with minimal overhead costs. But I had to put on my real business hat of how, you know, you would get funding. How do you, mm -hmm. how do startups function? It was very much a, you know, university of Google situation yeah. too, where I had to learn a lot of things that I didn't know. Um, and so I took a lot of the, the profit that I was making from the butter half and I put it into the, mm -hmm. into the conference. And so I had to make that choice. And, you know, I'm, I recognize that I'm in a position that allows me to, because I have a partner who works full time and can provide for our family and not mm -hmm. everybody has that. And so I 100% yep. recognize that, acknowledge that, sure. but it was a risk that I was willing to take because I think there's a lot of value in those in-person connections because there already are a lot of you know, food blogger, educational platforms, obviously the food blogger pro community, mm. but that in-person connection yep. was the one gap that I wanted to fill. And so in terms, you know, of revenue of like how that all works is I took my strength and wheelhouse of brand partnerships, which I feel like has always been something that is easy for me because I love people and I'm so extroverted. And so we built it off the model off of, you know, ticket sales and sponsorships. Mm -hmm. And so that is a really big part of our revenue. And having those existing relationships was able, we were able to, to set a, a framework for creating it. So it would be profitable. And we have fortunately been profitable, you know, with the exception of the pandemic, but yeah. that was just a, a weird thing totally. where we just had to roll everything over. I have some friends who have yeah. related kind of conference businesses or in-person mm -hmm. event businesses. And it's like, if there's one business, it's like, literally yeah. the, the, the main uh, purpose is to gather large in groups person. of people together in person. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that honestly, full transparency has been super hard, but again, I've been able to weather that just through, you know, smart yeah. business planning and having things saved and having resources. And that's the importance of saving for a rainy day when you are running yeah. a business, when, when there's hiccups. What, when you, so you talk about, obviously there's ticket sales that go into a conference. That's a piece of it. Obviously people buy a ticket to attend. Um, easy to understand. What about on the brand side, when there's a brand coming to a conference, what are they looking to achieve? And what is their hope in terms of sponsoring or maybe having like a booth at a conference? Uh, Cause that's an area where I think conceptually you kind of understand it, but I'd be curious to know from your inside understanding, what is a brand looking to get out of when they attend a conference? Yeah, so that is a great question. And I think, again, the answer is always, well, it depends. Overall, what we offer, though, is experiential marketing, which is its own form of marketing where you get to showcase your product in person and create an activation is what it's called, where you can engage with that product. Mm -hmm. So, for example, say... Uh, if we had somebody with a blender come and uh, a blender brand or a brand that has a blender that they offer, they could have uh, presence inside of our snack bar. 
could be blending the smoothies right right there in in the middle of the conference. People can be in, in a, engaging with it. They can be interacting. They can see how it works, and they are able to see the functionality uh, of that which you wouldn't otherwise be able to really convey. There's only so much you can do through video yeah. and photos, where that hands-on experience is so incredibly important. And so it provides that, but also because our conference is different and that we gather influencers, there's a lot of social reach and uh, ability to have a lot of social media visibility Mm -hmm. inside of a vacuum for these two days where people are posting because they're really inspired. And there is a word for what you were talking about earlier of that feeling that you have. It's called effervescence. Yeah, it's a, it's a sociological term. It's yeah. called that. If you want to like get nerdy and go read about effervescence, there's lots of that. academic literature uh-huh. out there on that. Huh. But you know, people, I think there's something to be said to to interact with that. And then in terms of you know how else can a brand get an ROI? Because that is another important aspect I think of when we're recruiting brands or brands are thinking about coming is, okay, what is this going to do for me there? And so I think just making those in person connections with influencers for those brands who are wanting to do influencer marketing, or they already are, and they want to meet people in person, because as you know, it's so different when you meet somebody in person, even just over a Zoom call, as great as it is, like it would be very different if you and I were sitting down in person, having a coffee, tea, whatever, and and talking face to face. Yeah. What do you see? uh, So two parts of this question, the brand side, and then the the influencer, blogger, creator side. Uh, For an somebody who's a publisher, we'll use that as a broad term, who's coming to an event like this, obviously there's learning. That's a huge piece of it. How do you get to know new things that are happening, trends, um, you know, and it's, and you are sitting down and like watching it in a way that you wouldn't, if you're watching a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. Um, but then there's also the piece where there's a networking element. Maybe it's with other creators and publishers, but also with brands. Do you see that as a, reason for somebody who is a creator to attend a conference or would you say that's kind of secondary or maybe a a third tier type focus where you see connections coming out of this where hey you have a partnership with a brand who's also attending the conference yeah so we our brand values are built on this very concept of community number one education and experience and so i think the most important thing is that community aspect where you're getting to go meet other like-minded people who do the same thing you do because it's not every day you meet a food blogger. I mean, when people Mm -hmm. ask me, oh, what do you do for a living? I'm like, I throw events Mm -hmm. and teach people about food blogging and content creation. And they're like, it's a niche. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That, I'll never meet anybody ever again that does that. Uh-huh. And so it's just, you know, how refreshing it is when you meet somebody and you're like, oh, you're a food photographer. You, you're a food yeah. blogger. Oh, me too. You and get you it. Yeah. Out. Yeah. You get it. And so being able to facilitate that because we have a lot of great testimonials and just personal stories that attendees who have now become personal friends of mine have told me that they're like, you know, I would not be at, at the point that I am with my blog if I had never gone to Tastemaker, if I had never gone mm-hmm. to this event. Because you meet people who who get you, who are in a similar phase of your business that you're, you know, you're currently struggling through or you're trying to to achieve a certain goal. You can find accountability buddies and again, effervescence. Like it's a very real thing that we need as social beings. And, and then in terms of the brand partnerships, like, do we see people having success with those? This is more of an opportunity to get that face-to-face interaction so that when you follow up and you send somebody an email and you're like, Hey, remember we met at this yeah. event, love to work with you somehow. I think that goes so much further and getting your foot in the door when they're receiving, you know, thousands of emails, it just puts you, you know, on top of the stack versus being like in the slush pile. You know, yeah. and so I think there is a lot of value in that. Or, you know, if you already work with a brand and they're going to be at the event you're going to, what a great way to meet somebody in person and have that face-to-face interaction. What I want to make sure that we get at the end here is a chance to talk about the upcoming conference. So you're putting together the pieces for it. It's happening in March, Midwest. Shout out to Chicago. It's mm-hmm. very rare that we have a conference that like we could drive to in a day uh, here uh-huh. in the Twin Cities. Um, and just love the city of Chicago, uh, obviously an awesome, uh, food city as well. Talk Mm -hmm. about what, um, people can expect for that. And I know that you have a discount for podcast listeners want to make sure that you can 
shout out, uh, shout out that as well. Uh, so just give us a little preview of what's to come in March. Yeah, so the upcoming conference is on March 3rd and 4th in Chicago. It'll be at the historic Rebel Motor Row, and we're actually hosting it in partnership with the Inspired Home Show, which is the world's largest home and housewares appliance trade show. And, you know, I've been working with them over the past years. They had some influencer conferences and creator pieces, and we decided, hey, why don't we just do a B2B thing and come together? And so with that, you get access to the conference, which is on a Thursday and Friday. Um, There are 30 classes, there's breakout sessions, we have keynotes, panels, lots of great content. We have brands coming that will be exhibiting that you can network with, speed networking elements there. We'll have that tech hall for anybody who needs help with their SEO or the tech side of things. So a lot of good hands-on opportunities. We also have a pop of uh, a shop up swag, or I'm saying that incorrectly. Pop up shoppable <laughs> swag. There we go. Five times twister fast. of yeah. the day. <laughs> um, you know, so a good way to get your hands onto current new products. And then in addition to that, the next day you get access to the show. And so that is a wonderful opportunity in its own right. And we actually have a special speed networking session with some brands that are exhibiting at the trade show who want to work with uh, creators. Cool. in general. And so really, it's it's really a great place to come meet brands, meet your fellow food bloggers, creators, and be able to see people in person. Yeah. And, and to your point of like the food element, we also have excursions that we do that are a separate ticket um, on Saturdays. So we get to go to restaurants and hang out and, and see the city and the cool architecture. So it's awesome. just going to be a really cool, fun event. The best way for people to, to, to take advantage of that is what? I just want one more chance to... Uh talk through, go to the website, use the discount code. What does that look like? Yes. So you can go to tastemakerconference.com. That's where we sell our tickets. And then listeners get a $50 off discount code, which will be good for one week. We are setting uh, a time limit on that just because as you mentioned, they are capped tickets. So as soon as they sell, they sell and we can't offer more. So yeah, definitely check out our website. You can also follow us at tastemakerconference.com. We're on Instagram. That's where we hang out mostly. If you want to connect socially, you can sign up for our email list too to get cool. updates in your inbox. Great. And we'll do one to, to define it, one week from the day the podcast goes live. Does that work? That is correct. Okay. Yes. So if somebody's listening to this eight days after, bummer, you need to download the podcast in real time. And then the discount code, should we include it? What's the best way to include that or, or to let people know about it? Do you want to, we can send it an email. We can put it in the blog post. You could say it right now. What would be the best? Yeah. Let's do food blogger pro 50. Great. Uh, so we have that. Anybody who's listening in real time, you get the bonus of getting that discount code. Abby, anything else that you'd like to say, uh, as we wrap up here, uh, words of inspiration or, um, uh, from somebody who has started uh, something, built something, had success with something for other people who are in the middle of doing a similar thing. What are your words of wisdom or advice for fellow creators in their own right? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I feel like this is a, a, a great way to end it. Cause I've been thinking about this all day before this conversation was um, happening about uh, in 2017, when I had the idea to start Tastemaker, I remember running along the pathway in my house when I lived in California and I was listening to food blogger pro. There you go. It's, the full circle. it's full it's circle. It's full circle. circle. And I was like, <laughs> Oh, they are so inspiring. I need to do something. And like, <laughs> I conference. honestly attribute food blogger pro as part of the journey to starting this and us sitting here and talking about That's it. So awesome. it is full circle. And so my advice would be to just keep going, mm-hmm. have a vision for something, write it out, Put it on a sticky note, put it on your mirror on a wall and keep looking at it until you hit that. Because I think when we say things out loud, we put them out there, we hold ourselves accountable and you really can make things happen. So don't give up. Keep going. I love that. That's awesome. It was something that you had mentioned that I had made note of and and kind of was uh, nodding my head, which most people wouldn't see unless they watch a video, but you talked about grit and like it's, it's grit in general, but especially with a conference business in the middle of a global pandemic, like to mm-hmm. have the grit to be able to get through that. I think that was the word they used. Yep. But um, so often I think uh, the work doesn't look like 
what it is when you get up on stage and like welcome everybody mm-hmm. under the lights of, of the, you know, stage and everybody applauding. It's like the grit of showing up every day and, um, kind of grinding away and, and, and you've done that. So, uh, I want to commend you on that and oh, thank glad you. that food blogger pro could be a podcast could be a very small part of it and, um, excited to follow you with your journey, Abby. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Thank you.